Hello, my name is Stephanie Cuellar. I'm going to talk to you today about why I believe there should be an increase in funding for Hispanic serving institutions. Meet Juan. Juan is the first person in his family to attend college. He's from a low income background and intend, in, he attended an HSI, which I'll refer to Hispanic serving institutions as HSI throughout this presentation here in Texas. Repeatedly, he was on the dean's list, and he actually got accepted into medical school, and where he's now pursuing psychiatry. When asked why Juan attended this Hispanic-serving institution, he stated two reasons. He said it was close to home, and it was going to provide him a debt-free degree. This response is very consistent with what the literature shows about minority students, specifically first-generation and low-income students, and what they consider when they're choosing an institution. And the top two um, that are found in the research are proximity to home and affordability. So really quickly, let's talk about what Hispanic serving institutions are. These are usually included under the broad category of minority serving institutions. So you may have heard of historically black institutions, TCUs or tribal colleges, um, and anapesis. Those are the Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions. And there's a few more within there, that, but these are the, the main ones that we hear about in the literature. <clears throat> They're also accredited degree-seeking institutions that enroll at least 25% Latinx students. Um, they can be two-year or four-year public or private institutions. They just have to meet the enrollment requirement of 25% Latinx students. The other requirement is that 50% of the students that attend the institution must be low income. So they must be able to receive federal funding and be uh, on needs base. Um, and then there's approximately 523 HSIs in the United States. HSIs have huge success rates, so they increase achievement among La the Latinx population. Um, they serve a historically underserved population, so our low-income and first-generation students, and they offer educational opportunities to 66% of Latinx graduate stu graduate student undergraduate students, and they've increased the associate degree rate and the bachelor degree rate among our Latinx population. However, despite all the success, they still are, have an issue with funding. So just over half of these institutions receive Title V funds, and this only accounts for a really, really small percentage of their overall budget. So their budgets are approximately $20 million a year, or, or on average $20 million a year for HSI budgets, and the funds that they receive only account for 1% to 2% of their overall budget. Additionally, for every $1 that other institutions receive, Hispanic-serving institutions only receive $0.68 cents of federal funding from the government, so $0.68 cents to every dollar for other institutions that are federal federally funded or receive federal funding. And there are approximately 328 emerging Hispanic serving institutions in the United States, which means they don't quite meet, meet that 25% enrollment threshold. Um, and they're anywhere between 15% to 24.9% Hispanic enrolling. So that means this pot of money is potentially going to be stretched even thinner among these additional 328 institutions if they do become, if they do meet that threshold of 25%. So some of the controversy that surrounds funding minority serving institutions um, or Hispanic serving institutions, are, it's framed in a larger picture of why we shouldn't fund minority serving institutions. Um, they're viewed, some of the reasons are they're viewed as um, a form of institutionalized racism or segregation, and that race conscious admissions are unconstitutional and unfair. So you can think about the Harvard case last year, um, where a lot of controversy was um, brought up about some of their admission procedures and race, 
uh, race conscious and admissions um, and some even go as far to say that these institutions practice racial exclusion and they should their doors should be shut altogether another big topic that um is against or used against uh, funding minority serving institutions is that some people believe that MSIs should make their own way. So they should be held to the same standards as any other school or, or higher educational institution um, and they shouldn't receive pressure, preferential funding. And so they believe that they should have to come up with their own money, money, so either through tuition or alumni donations or other forms of revenue. And then the final um, argument that I'll discuss is more specific to HSIs. Um, so because HSIs are demographic-based, they're not mission-based, they're just you got to meet that 25%, some people say that they weren't necessarily formed with the intent to serve Latinx students. In fact, a lot of the administration, faculty, and staff that you'll see at HSIs are largely or predominantly white individuals. So this leads people to, to question or to conclude that instead of being Hispanic serving, these institutions are actually just Hispanic enrolling. However, when these arguments are framed, um, specifically when you're grouping all MSIs together, you, these arguments are failing to take into account the differences between MSIs. So for example, I mentioned HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. So those are mission-based. They all were established prior to 1964 and they're with, with an intent to serve um, or to create educational access for blacks, whereas HSIs are demographic enrolling. So you just see the differences just between those two. They're very different. Um, another thing that those arguments fail to realize is that MSIs enroll diverse populations. So HBCUs don't only enroll blacks, just as HSIs don't only enroll Latinx population. Um, and all of these MSIs enroll white students. Finally, these arguments pay little attention to the positive outcomes of MSIs and what these institutions are able to do with little money. So for example, MSIs, what we know about them is they graduate a disproportionate amount of judges, dentists, and doctors and teachers of color. Um, they also graduate a lot of students of color going into STEM professions, and they in, they've shown to increase overall achievement among minority students. So some of the arguments for increased funding um, we'll, we'll begin to discuss, but I'd like to start with national demographics. Again, because HSIs are demographic-based, I think it's important to evaluate how our national spread affects our HSIs. So nationally, the Latinx population is one of the youngest and fastest growing populations in the U.S. So about 61% of Latinx populations uh, or population, they are 35 years old or younger, and they made up at least 20% of our K-12 through system um, in 14 states in the U.S. And um, secondly, the U.S. reached a historic high um, in 2018 with over a million million increase in just 2017 alone. So there are about 60 million Latinx individuals in the United States now. <clears throat> And the number of HSIs has increased just within a 10 year span. It increased by 80, or excuse me, 98%. And again, think about that over 300 emerging HSIs that are could potentially be HSIs um, within the next academic year. And then again, a little um, closer look at the growth of the Latinx population in the United States. So this is from the census. And right now we're sitting at about a little over 62 million in 2020, which makes up about 19% of the U.S. population. 
and in 40 years from now in 2060 it's going to be over 11 or 111 million which will be over a quarter of our our population the second point that i'd like to make is hsi serve a population that really needs to be served because they've been underserved so the students that attend like I said, are typically low income and first generation students. And these are people that have been deprived adequate education up until now. Um, essentially, the K through 12 system failed them. Additionally, one of the requirements that I wanted to save to mention until this point is um, to quote it, to be eligible, HSIs must have a low level of total expenses for the essential educational activities of the institution. So in other words, these institutions must have need, a, a financial need as well. So not just the students that make them up, but the, the institution itself also needs to have a need. Um, about 62%, 62% of HSIs enroll less than 5,000 students, so they're small, and 42% um, of them, so nearly half, not quite there, are two-year public um, schools. So in sum, these are small community colleges that already have slim budgets. So it's not really reasonable to then go ask them to raise money on their own um, through tuition or donations or charging you know they can't really hire or charge higher tuition if they're already educating low-income students and then the final point is about success of these institutions so we know that hsis um, have increased access and completion among latinx population over the past 20 years, the Latinx undergraduate student enrollment has tripled, while in the same time span, these 20 years, the Latinx representation in overall college enrollment has doubled. And their combined, HSI's combined persistent and completion rates at four-year institutions is 74%. So overall, the policy recommendation would be to increase funding. Uh, HSIs have doubled in the past um, 20 years. The, the amount of them has doubled. Um, yet we haven't seen that same proportion of increase in funding. So there has been a slight increase in funding, but nowhere near double the funding. So again, you're looking at a pot that's being stretched thinner and thinner and these institutions are known for having to do more with less um, and as again we have so many emerging hsis coming um, down the pipe over 300 of them it is very crucial that we consider in in a timely fashion to increase funding title five funds for these institutions um, and then it's likely, again, looking at the national demographics and keeping in mind that HSIs are demographic-based, if we know Latinx population is increasing, we know the HSI, or we can assume the HSI number will also increase. So if we, if we fail to increase, uh, we're looking at, there's about, HSIs educate about 1.5 million a year, uh, Latinx, 1.5 Latinx students. Um, a year and we're looking at these students not getting as as much funding or as much service as they need um, to give them a quality education and support throughout their their college experience so in conclusion um, we need to increase funding for HSIs and we need to do it quickly thank you